This tutorial is brought to you by Yellow Images. More about them later. Hi everyone, I'm Evan Abrams, and in this After Effects tutorial, I'm gonna take a look at turning motion or expressions, or maybe even mathematical formula, into shape layer paths, often called splines. We often have to make the path first, and that will drive the motion of the other elements, which means we have to already know what that path would be. But I'm here to show you that we can always go the other way around. If we can get anything into motion, we can turn that motion into a visible and sometimes dynamic path using a few methods. We're gonna look at a couple of effects-based ideas and then a solution that is a bit more destructive, but does in fact make a clean vector result with, you guessed it, even more expressions. If you have any questions as you're watching, please do leave them in the comments and I'll try to help you out. And if you like this kind of thing, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll know when new tutorials come up around here. Let's start with the problem. If a layer's movement is defined by keyframes, we can literally just copy those positional keyframes, paste them to a path. Here I have a circle moving around. The position is defined by these Bezier handles and points. I copy the entire position property. I go to an existing path property on a mask or shape, paste, that's it. But what if the layer's movement is not defined by keyframes at all? If we want to make something move in a mathematical way or a generative way, we tend to use expressions and parenting to control that position. For example, since we have control of the X and Y coordinates of position, we can make use of this like a graphing calculator. Here I'm using the math.sign expression to move the circle up and down at one rate while using a different expression to move the circle left and right with a different amplitude and frequency. Here's another example where I'm using rotation and parenting to make a kind of spirograph movement. As you can see, we can't just copy that positional property and paste it to a path because that data doesn't line up anymore. If the movement of a layer is entirely controlled by an expression, we can simply convert that expression on position into keyframes. Select any property with an expression, go to animate, keyframe assistant, convert expression to keyframes. Now you can copy and paste those positional keys to an existing path property. And look at this, we've got that movement turned into a path we can apply a stroke to, or maybe a trim paths, things are working out. However, once we bake the expression to keys, we can't unbake that pie. If we modify the movement of the original object by changing these expressions, we'll need to redo the process to get a new path. And while this works wonders for something driven by an expression, it does nothing to solve our issue with parented layers and especially with layers controlled by complex rigging systems. So let's have a look at some processes that can close that gap, starting with some simple effects-based options that can at least draw the line visually. Even if these methods can't get us the data, they'll at least be dynamic and update when the motion path changes. Then we'll bring it all together and look at a better way to bake down any motion into a path. If you wanna skip ahead to that, chapter markers are in the description. And before we jump in, if you're enjoying the backgrounds and the examples and title cards in this tutorial, I'm happy to say that all those assets come from this video's sponsor, Yellow Images. Yellow Images is the number one marketplace of high quality premium mockups, creative fonts, images 360, and a creative store full of amazing graphical assets like brushes, presets, lettering, illustrations, patterns, textures, UX, UI kits, and much, much more. And while you can buy anything on their site a la carte, the best value is becoming a yellow ticket holder. Think of this like a Costco or Price Club membership that gives you access to lower prices if you're a power user of stock assets. As a yellow ticket Holder, it's almost 10 times cheaper. And as a member, you also get to enjoy 30% off mock-up services, half off the creative store, synchronization between Dropbox and Yellow Images, all saving you time and money. Follow the link in the description, use my code ECABRAMS20 to get 20% off any purchase from Yellow Images. These coupons are limited, so don't miss out on the discounts. A big thanks to Yellow Images for hooking us up with that and for supporting the channel. First, I want to examine a fairly easy method. If you're able to get a layer into motion, we can just use the echo effect, which will create the illusion of it scribing a path. For this example, we might use an expression to make the circle move up and down in a sine wave while moving uh, left or right at a constant rate of speed. We've done this with an expression on the position. Then if we simply apply the echo effect, we're able to see where that layer was relative to the frame in time. It's a little bit like onion skinning and other animation software. Be warned though, as we increase the number of echoes, we're really gonna be taxing the system. But when we do increase those echoes and we decrease the interval between those echoes, which is how far into the past each one is from the next, or you can flip the number around and push them into the future, we're able to take where this dot was and make it into a trail. Now we might style this up by dropping some more effects on it, maybe pre-compose it, but we can work with this because we've now turned that motion into a trail of information. By updating the position, everything else is updated because all these effects are doing is looking at where this thing was or will be in the timeline. 
Uh, in terms of specific effects, you might try dropping on here. If you have more gaps in your echoes and want to blend them together, maybe try a blur. Any old blur will do. Then clamp that result with a levels or curves on the alpha channel. This can smooth out the trail if you want a more organic look. You might even apply a rough and edges for a more inky, chunky vibe. And if you want the trail to fade off or decay, you will need to play around with these decay settings. This will cause each echo to be less opaque than the one that came before it, and this can be used to fade off the trail. And since it's adding some variety to the alpha channel, we can use an effect like Colorama to recolor the trail based on those alpha channel inputs. Simply set alpha as your input, and you'll get some interesting control over the results. You can ask Colorama to either overwrite the alpha information or keep the original alpha information if you want to maintain it. That's how I created this example file that you saw at the beginning. If you want it to look like this trail belongs to some object, like this lovely inky texture that looks like a planet, just parent any old layer to the thing that's being echoed. The simple white dot here is really just there to draw a line. It seems to be the trail of whatever we've parented to it because the motion is matching. But here's another concept I want to float to you. This next idea is what I like to call the paint bucket. Imagine we wanted to know where a car went. If we attached a leaking paint bucket behind the car, after it did some donuts, we'd be able to see where it drove by looking at the drops it left behind. We can do the same thing in After Effects by attaching a particle system to deposit particles wherever a layer has moved. These kinds of really strained metaphors can sometimes help conceptually, but here we have a layer that's parented to another that's parented to another, and they're rotating around making this wacky pattern. If we wanted to trace where that dot is going or where it has been, we just need to attach a particle system to it. I'm gonna show you how to do this with Particle Playground, one of the more basic particle systems we have access to, but at least we all have access to it, and the steps we take will be very similar at a methodological level to any particle system you might use, even fancy third-party ones. After we've applied the particle effect to a solid, step one is always to zero out things like gravity. We don't really want any physics affecting our particles right now, so whatever system you use, we're gonna have to put that gravity down to zero. Step two is then to bring the velocity down to zero. We want the paint dripping out, not spraying out. This is often found under the emitter settings. In this effect, it's called the cannon because we're shooting particles out of a cannon-like thing, I suppose. So we're gonna bring that direction down, the velocity down, the randomness down. If it's all good, if we've got it set up the way we want, we should just see one particle forever popping into existence on top of wherever that emitter is. It's like we're just jabbing a pen into the paper and it's not really going anywhere. It's releasing ink, but we haven't drawn a line with it. So then step three is to turn the movement of that object into the movement of the emitter. To do this, we need to get the position of this point as it relates to the frame of the composition rather than its current position data relative to whatever forces are acting on it. What do I mean by any of that? Well, let's say I make a null layer and parent that layer to the final point that's moving around. I've held down shift while parenting, so the null at least snaps right to that layer. You may need to move yours around manually depending on where you want it to happen, but this null is gonna be the point from which things will emit. If I were to make the emitter's position the same as this null's position, we would assume that that would place the emitter at the null. So I go to the emitter and I pick whip to that null's position, and look at this, it's not working at all. It's not even moving a little bit. That's because the null's position right now is defined by its relationship to its parent, which currently is at zero, zero. So pick whipping them together just makes the emitter's position zero, zero. So we must convert that nulls data into something that's frame relative. There are a few ways to do this, and I do get confused myself literally every time I try to use this expression, but we'll be leveraging the dreaded to comp function to make this happen. So instead of parenting, I'm gonna write this expression in. We've got variable L, which is just setting up a variable named L that is gonna point us to the layer we're interested in looking at. Then we'll look at that layer dot to comp, as in we're going to be looking at that layer and pulling something about it to the comp space. And what are we gonna be pulling in inside those parentheses? We'll be converting the location of that layer's anchor point. Where is that layer's anchor point in comp space or comp relative position? Why it's having a little dance around the frame. And that's the information that we needed. So at least now we have paint dropping out of the bucket where we want it. Then we just have to dial up how much paint, which would be how many particles per second, and what happens to the paint, which would be its longevity, how long is that lasting around its lifespan. And then we might look at styling this up with effects or layer styles. We might do something with the decay of this over time. And obviously we're kind of limited because this effect is making blocks. So we could deploy the exact same idea using CC particle systems, another included plugin that has more options for particle types you might explore, and it understands where the emitter 
is in the same way. Now, what's the better way of baking our movement into keyframes and then turning them into paths that will work for anything that's in motion? We've seen all the parts, now we just need to put them all together and improve that original destructive method, baking the movement into a spline. You might want to do this method if you want an actual shape layer path to be created from the motion. This process has three steps as well. We've already done step one in the previous paint bucket example. In case you skip that part, here it is again. We parent a null to the thing doing the movement that we want to trace, which will give us relative position. And now we're going to create a second null and call this the tracer. And we're going to use that lovely expression, just like we did on the emitters of the particle systems to make sure the layer's position is frame relative instead of layer relative. We've got that layer dot two comp, and then we're specifically asking for that layer's anchor point location in the composition coordinate space. And as you can see, we've got one null following around the other, but the position is updating relative to the frame. Now we can take that property and we can go keyframe assistant, convert expression to keyframes. Depending on how fast this thing is zipping around, you might have bigger gaps between your positions, smaller gaps between them. Whether or not that's gonna be a problem is pretty subjective, and you might have to smooth this data out with Bezier handles, or you might increase the frame rate before doing the conversion so that you have more points being recorded and then reduce the frame rate after to enjoy some subframe keys, but to get it nice and lined up. However, we are on to step three now. We select this property, which selects all the keyframes, or select only the keyframes you're interested in turning into points along your new path. Since this animation is looping, I really only need a section of these to turn into my path. And then we're going to go to a path property and paste. And notice where these go. Zero, zero in frame terms means up here in the top left corner. So you may need to move the shape layer up to that top corner for these things to line up exactly. Now you can see we have a path that matches the movement. We could put a stroke on here, maybe a trim paths. Maybe we offset that trim paths by bringing it on or off, whatever. But we have converted this relative movement into a spline. Sadly, we still had to bake something down in here. So if you update that original movement, you're gonna to need to do this process again to get that new data set as a spline. Now, if you stuck around this long, how about a bonus round? I wanted to share how we might do this in Cinema 4D, taking the movement of a thing and turning it into a spline, if only because this gets at the heart of how different apps understand, manipulate motion, but how they're all kind of similar in methodology. So here in this scene that I created in Cinema 4D R20, I have a sphere that's just moving around the scene using the vibrate tag, which is similar to the wiggle expression in After Effects. You can apply the vibrate tag from the many, many tags available, then pick which properties change over time and how much and how often, all in the tag attributes. And when we play through, you can see it's really going. So if I want to make a spline out of this, how do we convert this data from one form into another? There's actually a special object for just such thing. I call it the tracer. I'll just drop that into my scene here and add the sphere to the list of objects I'm tracing. Hit play and <laughs> ooh -wee, that's a lot of lines. I'll simplify by asking it to not trace the vertices of the sphere. And look at this, we have a little thread being drawn out here. I've converted the data from one form to another. Then, just like we do in After Effects, I might want to style this up by maybe making it part of a sweep object. So I'll make a sweep, add the tracer in here, add a circle in as the thing being swept along that tracer, and now we have this lovely noodle being extruded out into the world. Not particularly complex, not particularly art-directed, but I wanted to show you this because at a core level, no matter what the app is, this kind of thinking is the same. We're converting data from one form to another, then working that new data to be visually what we want to see. So much of motion design is about this interplay of converting from one thing to another, and I hope this opens up that way of thinking for you. I hope these methods help you and inspire you to make some cool spirographs, perhaps? If you have other methods to make this happen, I would love to hear about them. But if you have any trouble with this stuff, do let me know in the comments and I'll try to help you out as best I can. If you enjoyed learning this kind of thing, you find it helpful, please subscribe, turn on notifications so you know when new things are coming up around here. And hey, share it around with your fellow creatives. I'm sure they would love to know this as well. If you make something cool with this, and I know you will, I would love to see it. Tag me at EC Abrams on Twitter and Instagram, and please reach out to me on there if you have any troubles in after effects, motion design, visual effects. Thanks for watching. Until next time, stay creative and be kind to each other. Bye for now.